Hey, peace lovers. Welcome to another edition of Anarchcast, your home for anarchy on the internet and around the around the world on satellite radio on the Liberty Radio Network. I have a great guest coming on. I've wanted to have him on for a number of years, but he never had a webcam. Uh, he eventually he bought a webcam, and so now we can finally have him on. It's Scott Horton. He uh, is one of the uh, people at Antiwar.com. He's the uh, editorial editor at Antiwar.com, and he also has his own show, The Scott Horton Show. A uh, great show. It's uh, all about war, unfortunately, or anti-war, which is the best, the positive way of looking at it. Uh, there's lots to talk about about war right now, and so it might be a good time to have him on and get his perspective on what's going on in the world, because there's a lot of hot spots flaring up all over. I've been seeing that, and uh, there seems like a lot of saber rattling going on, and I think we could be headed into a very hot summer here, so I want to get his opinion on that. But uh, the very first thing I have to ask you, though, Scott, is how did you become an anarchist? Well, well, first of all, thanks very much, Jeff, for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, so how I became an anarchist? Well, I guess I was always a libertarian. And then, uh, you know, I really didn't have the Internet too much until uh, about 2002 in the run-up to the Iraq War. And so, um, you know, I'd been on and I'd had it for a little while in the past and all that. But uh, I had not really been exposed to, to any libertarian thought other than, uh, you know, kind of what you would hear from maybe Cato or the Libertarian Party, something like that. So I never was really, um, you know, very closely associated with the Libertarian Party or anything like that. But just all the libertarians that I knew were basically, as far as I knew anyway, were limited republic, you know, constitutionalists. And, I, you know, my argument always was, and it was kind of a pragmatic argument, too that, you know, we'd all like to see no state, but really you got to have just enough of one to prevent a worse one from replacing it. And so, you know, that's the, the world we live in kind of thing. And then uh, it wasn't until the run-up to the Iraq War, uh, I was reading antiwar.com all the time, and they were linking to lewrockwell.com. And I started reading Lou Rockwell about, uh, in fact, it was, it was his review of Herman's, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's book, The National Defense Myth. And it was just about, you know, uh, at the very bottom line, that's the game they're selling. If you're, if you're the absolute minarchist, the argument is you got to have enough of a state to keep a worse one from replacing it, basically. And, and Lou's argument and Hoppe's argument was that doesn't wash because you look at these guys and all they do is get us into trouble and start wars and do, you know, the the very opposite of real national security for the country and the people in the country. And so, you know, we're just better off without them. We just don't need them. And I guess I, I had always thought that all, all anarchists were basically anarcho-communists. I never knew that there were like these, you know, bow-tied Austrian free market guys <laughs> who actually were willing to be 100% anti-state, the Mises Institute and so forth. So as soon as I learned about that, I thought, oh, yeah, that's for me. I read uh, Rothbard, you know, Anatomy of the State and Left and Right, The Prospects for Liberty and uh, Confessions of a Right-Wing Liberal and these kinds of things. And I says, oh, okay. You know, I get it now. I, I don't have to be a constitutional. I kind of thought I had to be a constitutionalist, you know, but it, as, soon as, if, as soon as I found out I didn't have to be, that was the end of that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's not uh, required. Um, and yeah, as you sort of pointed out, uh, we have all these governments and there's nearly constant war, especially in the 20th century. That was just hundreds of millions of people getting killed over nothing. And, and looking back at each of those wars, it's mostly all just banker wars. And the people themselves didn't really want to do it most of the time. And they just got sort of uh, manipulated into doing it through propaganda, the same thing they're still doing today. And so maybe we should talk about that, what's going on today. Uh, first uh, thing, maybe, I, uh, unless you want to make a general statement on what's going on in the world today. But other than that, I'd like to get your opinion on ISIS, because I keep hearing a lot of people talk about ISIS. I was actually on the phone with my mom, who doesn't have the internet or anything, so she gets all of her news from the TV, uh, which is horrible. And she brought up ISIS to me. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh man, they're really getting people thinking about this ISIS thing. Um, what's your take on ISIS or generally what's going on in the world today? Well, uh, you know, at the time of the September 11th attack, Al Qaeda was, you know, very soon after that, they were basically all bombed to death. So you had about four or 500 guys, maybe. And then about 400, probably say about 500 and about 400 of them got bombed to death. And then about 100 escaped, or, you know, 80 to 100 escaped into Pakistan, including Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri. 
and uh, where, you know, uh, Zawahiri still lives, I guess, and, and bin Laden lived until 2011. But it was basically a band of pirates that you could have filled one little wooden ship with. Uh, but then George Bush invaded Iraq. And for the, for the partisans in your audience, don't worry, because I'll get to Obama's fault in a second. But it's 100% Bush's fault, because just as his sock puppet dictator, Hosni Mubarak, warned him in 2002, if you do this and you invade Iraq, you're going to create 10,000 bin Ladens. And, of course, the Bush attitude was, oh, bring them on. A bunch of stateless nobodies with AK-47s. We're not worried about that. We're, this is, we're an empire now. We create our own reality. We do whatever we, you know, whatever we want. The war against Iraq is the war against Saddam and his government, and the Iraqi people are just extras and, you know, the fantasy that is going to play out here, that kind of thing. And they just ignored that. And then in invading Iraq, they ended up taking the side of the... Uh, Shia, 60% majority of the country, who have been kept down by the Sunni minority, and they're also backed by Iran the whole time. And in taking their side, they drove all the Sunnis, first of all, out of Baghdad, and second of all, into the arms of what was then called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And they were the worst part of the Sunni insurgency resistance against the Americans, and who oftentimes targeted Shiite. Uh, uh, civilians in marketplaces and schools and this kind of thing in order to, because this is how terrorism works, to provoke that reaction. And so the more the Shiites would kill Sunni civilians, the more the Sunni civilians would end up relying on these Al-Qaeda and Iraq types who were, they weren't 10,000, but they were a few thousand. And then um, the, the local tribes, this is kind of a side note for our story, but the, the Sunni tribes marginalized the worst of the suicide bomber bin Ladenites and made a kind of truce with the Americans in 2006 and 7, the so-called awakening movement. And the Al-Qaeda and Iraq guys were more or less marginalized. That is, until 2011 and the outbreak of the Arab Spring, which was in its own ways blowback from the invasion of Iraq. Um, but I don't want to go too far off into that. But the point being that it, the Arab Spring terrified the Americans, the, the empire, because uh, people were rising up against their dictatorships. Well, who backs their dictatorships? They're all American sock puppets over there, except for Syria and Iran. The rest of them are basically owned lock, stock, and barrel by the U.S. And so when they overthrew Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, the Americans, and then riots started breaking out in Libya. The, well, let me say, after the revolution in Egypt, when Mubarak was overthrown, the Americans looked really bad. It was even on CNN that like, hey, this is the population of Egypt, as broadly defined as you could name it, all agreeing with each other they want to overthrow this evil dictator they've been saddled with for 30 years who America backs. And that simple truth was getting through the heads of Americans. That Uncle Sam is the bad guy here. He's not the force of democracy. He's the force of a military dictatorship that's being thrown aside. So they wanted to confuse the issue. And there's, you know, six or seven different, I mean, there's more to it than this. But I think the primary motivation for Hillary Clinton, uh, who pushed Obama to do the war in Libya, was to try to hijack the Arab Spring to spin it, just to confuse the issue more than anything else and say, look, America's on the side of the rebels against the evil dictator in this one. So forget what you just saw in Egypt. You know, America, it's just like that time we liberated France from the Nazis or whatever. And it's, you know, we're, the, we're Superman on the side of the little guy. Well, it turns out the little guy in Libya was Al-Qaeda. They were the, the Libyan veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq from Iraq War II. And just like, you know, bin Laden and his guys were the guys who came home from the Afghan war in the 80s that the CIA backed. Here, these are the guys who came home from Iraq uh, to Libya. And then right after taking the side of them in Libya, even though Gaddafi had been brought into the cold, in from the cold by Bush in 2003, he was no loyal sock puppet like Mubarak. He was still crazy Colonel Gaddafi and not too reliable and therefore expendable so that they could do this publicity stunt, basically and seize the oil resources. Uh, but then the, and then the next thing they did immediately, as everyone knows, because there's just no denying it because it's such a huge scandal it was, they started funneling guns and Mujahideen warriors off to Syria in order to hijack the Arab Spring in Syria and use that for their long planned regime change against the Baathist, uh, you know, secularist dictatorship there. 
And uh, it became a big scandal, of course, because of Benghazi, because it blew up in their face. Because what are they doing? They're arming their enemies. They got a base in the middle of all their enemies. And then they're surprised that they get killed. Well, they were aligned with their enemies, but that didn't mean their enemies liked them. And so, um, you know, that was what led to the death of Ambassador Stevens back in 2012. And then they've been pushing this same thing in Syria ever since then. Since 2011, you have America, Saudi, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel on the side of the bin Ladenites against the secular fascist dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad, who is a secular fascist dictator, but he shaves his chin every morning and wears a three-piece suit and is not a bin Ladenite, and we are back in the bin Ladenites against him. We are back in we, the U.S. Empire and its allies, are backing the head chopper, uh, you know, uh, uh, crucifiers. These guys crucify their enemies to death. People, you know, for breaking moral laws and stuff. I mean, they're completely out of control. And so this is what has re led to the rise of the Islamic State. And what the, the reason Islamic State is not called Al-Qaeda is because they broke off from Al-Qaeda. They were. The Al-Nusra Front in Syria is just Al-Qaeda in Syria. They're basically the Syrian veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, from Iraq War II who came home to Syria and started that war. Well, the Iraqi veterans of Iraq War II came to help them for a while, but there were personality conflicts there. And so what happened was Baghdadi and his guys, who were primarily Iraqis, broke away from the, the Syrian guys and from the orders of Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was bin Laden's second in command and had taken over al-Qaeda. And he was trying to boss them around from Pakistan, and, and they said, well, you know, how are you going to enforce your orders, Captain, so forget you. And they, they saved up, got enough power, enough land, enough tax base, enough uh, weapons that they got from America's, you know, mythical moderate allies who basically just served as the arms merchants uh, putting American guns and American bought guns in the hands of the Mujahideen. And then one year ago, they rolled into Mosul, which is a huge Sunni Arab city in northern Iraq, and they declared a caliphate, the Islamo fascist caliphate that was always a joke, right? This was when George Bush in 2005 was in the middle of creating this thing. He was saying, oh, those Islamo fascist caliphate is going to get you. Well, what was he talking about? They didn't control a single square mile anywhere. Unless you want to count our allies, the Saudi kingdom, but that's kind of different, right? So wh what were they even talking about? At the time that they killed bin Laden in, in May of 2011, the Islamofascist caliphate was his attic where he was hiding from his wife. Now, thanks to Obama, thanks to first Bush's massive folly in turning all of Western and Northwestern Iraq into lawless Sunni gladiator academy, you know, uh, jihadistan. Um, Obama came and he, where Bush accidentally committed treason for Osama and served Osama, Obama, as soon as he, whatever they did with his body, as soon as they were done with Osama, they immediately allied with him in Libya and in Syria, and it has blown back into this huge thing. And of course, all of our allies, I'm sorry for going on for so long, but it's kind no, of a keep, mess. That's fine. All of our allies are in on it with us for our enemies, right? It's not Iran, and it's not Syria, and it's not Hezbollah who attacked us on September 11th. It was Al-Qaeda that did it, and backed by the Saudis. And in fact, apparently some of them took flight training in Turkey. Maybe we need to focus a little bit more on that. So America is on the side of all of its allied states are backing the, the Mujahideen, the same bad guys for, that we used in the 80s, uh, in the Reagan years against the Soviets, that we pissed off in the Bill Clinton years um, by uh, bombing Iraq from Saudi and continuing to support the Israeli occupations in Lebanon and Palestine, and that uh, then they've fought in effect for, while they fought against and for these guys alternately back and forth this whole time. But if you, if you turn it to the news, you'll see massacre in, uh, in uh, Tunisia. You'll see a suicide bombing in Saudi Arabia at a Shiite mosque, a suicide bombing in Kuwait at a Shiite mosque. Uh, there was a, an attack in France where this guy got his head cut off and stuck up on the fence post a few days ago. There uh, were uh, 200 and something 
uh, Kurdish civilians who were massacred by the Islamic State the other day. And they have carved out a space in western Iraq and eastern Syria that's the size of Great Britain. And as Patrick Coburn was uh, explaining, they rule more people, they have more population in their country than most of the members of the United Nations and most of the states in the world. And they've got conscription and they've got taxation. And I mean, I guess they may be a pretty weak state, but they're a hell of a strong terrorist group. And they do have an interest, and I don't mean to scaremonger like the lying evil scaremongers, but they do have an interest in attacking the United States of America and in attacking our allies, Jeff, because what they want is the same reason that bin Laden attacked us all through the 90s uh, and up to September 11th, to try to bait us and get us to go over there to bleed our empire to bankruptcy. And, you know, what Obama did was basically cheat them out of their victory by leaving early before the dollar was completely broken. Although maybe you'd quibble with me about that. I don't know as much about the currency stuff as you probably. But, um, but that's what the policy is, is to use, you know, judo on, on the Americans. To, to It's asymmetric warfare to provoke. They could send one or two guys, get one or two guys to shoot up a ball game or, you know, some kind of nightmare like that and try to provoke an American invasion of the Islamic State, a reoccupation of Mosul, Fallujah, that kind of thing. And it would actually take something pretty severe because the good news is the Americans have not invaded. I mean, they're bombing the hell out of them from the air, but the Americans have not invaded. They sent a few thousand troops, but apparently good reporting has it that the army leaders and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the rest of them, they do not want to do it. The State Department recently proposed a further escalation of a few thousand more troops, and they said a few hundred, but they proposed a few thousand more and some Apache helicopters and all this, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff vetoed it, and the Defense Department vetoed it and said there's way too much risk for no gain, and yeah. So, in other words, it's a, it's it's like a, it is. It's a freaking nightmare. It's Bin Laden incarnate, basically, in charge of a government as dictator of uh, what used to be Western Iraq and used to be Eastern Syria now. And there's nobody to get rid of them. And I'm not advocating America doing anything more. All they could ever possibly do, obviously, is make matters worse. But it looks like they're going to be around. Because the only, the only power in the region that could stop them would be the Israelis, who love them, as long as they're working against Hezbollah in Syria. They got no problem. Same with the Al Nusra Front. And the Turks, for the very same reasons. And so, you know, oh, our loyal allies, the Israelis, oh, they're our best allies and our best friends in the whole wide world. Oh, yeah, let's go see them fight the Islamic State for us then, if they're so useful to us. Of course they're not. And same thing with the Turks. They have a 300,000-man army, but they do nothing but help these guys out. So there's the bad news on the Islamic State. I don't know what else to say. There's no, like, uh, tidy kind of punchline to it. It's just an <laughs> ongoing catastrophe. Yeah, it's definitely a catastrophe. I kind of question about why it happened, though. Uh, for example, I have a different take on why these things are happening. Uh, I agree with you on what is happening, and it's good to get the information about what is happening from you because you follow these things. But I have a different take on why it happened. Uh, a year before 9-11, the uh, <clears throat> Project for a New American Century, which was Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, all the usual criminals, uh, came up with a plan. They said we needed a new Pearl Harbor, and that was actually done on September 11, uh, 2000. So exactly one year from September 11, 2001. And uh, there's a, a ton of evidence that uh, it, it was the U.S. government and, and actually Israel, uh, the Mossad, that were behind 9-11. Uh, and then uh, right after that, General Wesley Clark, I don't know if you ever saw this video, he came out and he said that he was handed a piece sure. of paper right after 9-11 saying, these are, we're going to attack and, and uh, occupy these seven countries in the next five years. And on that list was Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Libya. Uh, so they've already done uh, all those. Um, uh, Iran's on the list. It was the last one. Uh, there was one in Africa. I can't remember which uh, country. Somalia. Somalia. So you saw that speech, right? Sure. I, yes. I agree with uh, most of what you said there as far as, you know, the, the uh, motivation behind the policy is it's made in Israel. And the neoconservatives, they are basically agents of the Likud party in America. And... Uh, that's a huge part of why they promote American imperialism is because of Israel's interest and to guarantee Israel's interest. And I'm familiar with rebuilding America's defenses, the report that you're talking about and the new Pearl Harbor attack, which Brzezinski talked about that for in uh, the Grand Chessboard as well. Uh, but then again, that was a phrase that was used pretty often 
by Hawks to say, how do we motivate Americans to get them over their Vietnam syndrome? You need a shocking thing. In the first Gulf War, they knew it. it they basically, in desperation, they turned to nuclear weapons propaganda against Saddam because invading Kuwait and the incubator babies and stuff wasn't cutting <laughs> it. And so they practiced with the focus groups and they found out that you got to say nukes or people just, you know, or you have to have an actual some kind of attack like Pearl Harbor to, mo to mobilize people. And of course, for the Israelis and they're, they're, the neoconservatives, it's always World War II. So, um, and then as far as uh, American and Israeli involvement in the attack, uh, I'm not so certain as what you say. I mean, I think that there are, and, and I've done some radio shows about this, and I've read quite a bit about it. Ramondo at antiwar.com, of course, is all hot on the high fivers and all that kind of thing. So I know about what you talk about, but to me, the evidence is still too circumstantial. To me, the very hottest angle, I, it, just in my imagination, rather than anything I can demonstrate, but I think that there's a, a real likelihood and that this would be the key, that Prince Bandar had a wink and a nod and an agreement with the Americans to help Al-Qaeda do it. And I believe it was Al-Qaeda that did it. I believe that the, the Hamburg cell of hijackers, for example, were recruited by Osama bin Laden and his guys in Afghanistan uh, and that kind of thing. But of course... You know, we could spend the rest of this show talking about what the CIA and the NSA didn't share with the FBI about what they knew about who, again, real ass Al Qaeda in America for, hey, a year and a half. For a year and a half, these guys were in the country. And so, you know, there, there certainly is a circumstantial argument there to make that they let it happen. And I think there's a circumstantial case to make that Mossad knew what was going on and wasn't talking about it with the Americans until maybe August of 2001. Um, but I, I won't go as far as a lot of the truthers do with that kind of thing because I think most of the stuff doesn't quite hold up or, or really doesn't quite hold up the narratives that, that people might think they do. Or I just tend to disagree with it, I guess. And, and yeah. part of it is because who attacked us in 1993 and in 1996 and 1998 and tried in 2000, oh, and did in 2000? It was al-Qaeda that did it. It was, you know, Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Uh, mixed with Osama bin Laden's, uh, what, what became of the Azam group uh, from the Afghan war. And they were behind the World Trade Center attack, the, the plot to kill Bill Clinton and the Pope in Manila in 1995 and to bomb planes, the Bojinka plot over the Pacific. I mean, that wasn't a CIA job. You know what I mean? That, you know, Ramzi Youssef wasn't a CIA agent in that case. And then Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's his uncle. I don't know of any reason to think he was CIA either. But anyway, it is a giant, complicated mess, and, and I just, you know, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know the, who sort all of the point that I wanted to I'd like to see, and, I, and I, I hate all the tangents and kind of weird stuff, and so I want to see, like, really good concrete stuff, you know? Yeah, no, no, I, that's fine. We don't need to talk too much about that. I guess my sort of my, my only point is that it appears to me like they want uh, the U.S. government or uh, the people who control things, they want all these things that are happening. And that's why I brought up ISIS. Uh, it seems like almost every week they're accidentally airdropping all sorts of weapons to ISIS. Um, so it, I think th this is something they want. And uh, you, you actually mentioned that, that Israel really wants ISIS. And it's funny that ISIS never attacks Israel. You'd think that'd be like their number one target. Uh, so there's something going going on they want to foment this this massive uh, craziness over there and of course it in times of war which it is over there in many places including Syria it's uh, things do get very gray and hazy and uh, it's hard to tell who's doing what yeah hey um, well I think on the I don't know if the Islamic State has had opportunity to attack Israel uh, or whether they would or not or, or exactly I know that I know the Israelis are helping the al-Nusra front I don't know whether they've outright been helping the Islamic State. I wouldn't be shocked, but I can tell you that whenever anybody has poked their head up in the Gaza Strip and said they loved Osama or they loved Baghdadi, the Hamas guys kill them. And the Hamas guys have a no bin Ladenite rule for around here. And, uh, and that happened in, uh, well, I guess, three years ago or something. The Hamas guys went and killed like two or three dozen of these bin Ladenites at this mosque that had popped up. And they just said, yeah. absolutely not. So, you know, which is funny because if you ask Benjamin Netanyahu, Hamas is ISIS, is Iran, is, you know, China, whatever, <laughs> pretend, you, you know, whatever, make believe. But, uh, you know, I think that might be a, a big reason 
of why they don't attack Israel is because Hamas doesn't let them breathe long enough to attack anybody um, as far as that goes. But yes, I mean, look, this whole policy, if you go back to 1996 and David Wormser and the clean break, there's two studies, uh, a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm and coping with crumbling states. And uh, you can find them both at my website. And in fact, uh, I happen to know that Dan Sanchez has an awesome new article about this coming out, I think tomorrow, um, where he's writing all about this. Where, why attack Saddam? Because the road to Damascus runs through Baghdad. Now, this is idiocy, Jeff, right? Like, these guys are completely stupid. If you read this thing, they thought they were going to get a Hashemite king like they had in uh, Jordan, and that the Iraqi Shia supermajority that had been dominated all that time by the Sunni, well, they were just going to roll over and keep on taking it. And they wouldn't insist on any sovereignty at all, never mind them. And in fact, they're such docile Shiite Arabs there, they'll make a great example for how, how docile Iranians should be in the future too. And then we'll help, uh, once we kill Saddam, that'll help weaken Assad. Now, and why? Because Assad backs Hezbollah. And, and Iran backs Hezbollah. So Hezbollah, which is nothing but a piece of crap little militia, well, I don't want to say that. I mean, they're kind of a little mini state or something in southern Lebanon, but they're not. They're like ISIS, right? They're a really powerful militia. They're not much of a country, of a government, you know, force. Uh, they are they're a threat to Israel in the sense that they can repel attack only. And, um, and the Israelis want that river, right? So... That uh, how are you, Latik uh, River, whatever. Um, and so, um, yeah, no, that's what it's all about. I mean, if the American people, if you could take the average, just, you know, like as George W. Bush used to say, take the guys sitting at the bar in Lubbock and explain it to them. Well, okay, guys at the bar in Lubbock, it's real simple. There's a massive Sunni Shia civil war raging in the region. America is on all sides of it, including the side that attacked us on September 11th. Whose side are you on? Who would you prefer to see win here? Or, or what do you think about the President of the United States outright back in the head choppers when that's what's going on here? I mean, if, Bush, if what Bush did was the worst thing in the world, what Obama did is the highest treason. I mean, what, what he has done in sending the CIA and the military to send money and guns to these guys, first in Libya, but especially in Syria, the way they've done, and with the consequences that have come, I don't think there's a clear case for high treason in the history of American politics on the national level like that. I mean, mm -hmm. Jefferson charged Aaron Burr for trying to conquer Mexico, but that wasn't really treason because Mexico is not part of America, right? So... Interesting. I want to get your take also on the Ukraine. I think that's another very interesting hotspot that's still simmering. I don't really understand what's going on there. I've kind of, I've been watching. I don't know exactly what's going on, but it, it appears to me like the U.S. is just trying to cause problems again. This is the U.S. government's yeah. all over the world just trying to cause problems. Uh, they're, uh, you know, right on the doorstep of Russia. Uh, Putin isn't liking this very much. Uh, what's your take on what's going on in the Ukraine right now? Okay, well, very briefly, the big picture is when the Warsaw Pact dissolved, NATO did not. And since the late 90s, it's been expanding the last, you know, 17 years. And there's a great man. You got to read this if you haven't. Your audience, take a look, please. It's the only valuable thing that Thomas Friedman ever wrote, probably. And it's his interview with George Kennan, the original author of the Soviet containment policy, uh, the, the author of the Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs back in 1946 or 47, whatever. Um, and he's warning Thomas Friedman. He's saying, listen, these aren't the communists. These aren't the Soviets. These are the Russians. These are the guys who overthrew the communists. These are our friends. And if we backstab them and betray them and try to dominate all of Eastern Asia, what's going to happen is we're going to get a bad reaction from them and then watch all the hawks are going to pretend that that proves they were right, that it was necessary. That if the Russians dare to resist in any way, right, just like an Iraqi or a Palestinian or anyone else, if they resist in any way, uh, an American civilian on the street dealing with a deputy sheriff, if you resist in any way, that is, you know, the highest form of aggression in your life is forfeit, basically. Or, you know, in this case, it, it justifies whatever cruelty we brought in the first place. And so they have the three Baltic states right on the Russian border, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are members of NATO, and so is Poland. And then what they were doing, and they've been working on for since at least 2004 or whatever, and they've announced this, that they want to incorporate Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. 
And they had to back off on the Georgia bit because in 2008, their leader picked a fight uh, with Russian peacekeepers in South Ossetia and Putin's army came and solved that problem and drove them right back out again, guaranteed the independence of Ossetia and, uh, and checked the Georgians in a way that I think caught attention in Washington, D.C. They're like, well, maybe there is a line to, too far to cross or something for a minute. But then Ukraine. So in 2004, they had the Orange Revolution, where they overthrew the pro-Russian guy, uh, who, uh, Yanukovych, who they claimed stole the election, and they claimed the KGB had poisoned uh, uh, Yushchenko, his challenger, um, uh, causing his face to get these big warts on it and whatever. But it was a completely ridiculous uh, story, and the, the plot was debunked by an Austrian doctor named Wick, and you can read the whole story at antiwar.com about that. But they succeeded in what was called the Orange Revolution, a pure George Soros National Endowment for Democracy con job. They brought out all these giant screen TVs and created a big festival atmosphere, passed out orange banners to everyone. And they basically canceled the results of the election and, uh, and, so, and pretended that it had been stolen in the first place, although I don't know that there's really any reason to believe that. Uh, possibly it was. It's not like any side in Ukraine or angels, politically speaking. Um, but um, so, but they blew it. The American coalition, the Orange Coalition, they blew it. Uh, uh, they split uh, uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko, the gas princess, uh, who was his sidekick. They split. Their coalition fell apart. And she ended up uh, in league with Putin and the pro-Russian factions for a while and then being put in jail over it. And then... This guy, uh, Yanukovych, got elected again in 2010, the final you know, undoing of the Orange Revolution of 2004. He got elected in 2010. All the European observers said it was a free and fair election. It's a very, very divided and partisan country there in the first place. Uh, not much for good sportsmanship at democratic losses and that kind of thing. Uh, better luck next time and that kind of thing is not how they look at it. And so, but then... <laughs> comes the empire with uh, NATO and, of course, the European Union, the Germans as their front. And they're working on a trade deal with um, Yanukovych, the president. He says he'll sign it. And it has a bunch of austerity in it, IMF loans and terms and conditions and the usual terror there. But then they add a term that says, and if you have this trade deal with the European Union, you cannot have it with the Russians. Uh, that will be a breach of the deal, and we'll break our end of the deal if you have an open trade deal with the Russians, too. And Putin said, well, hey, instead of a bunch of, uh, you know, IMF uh, austerity uh, strangling, how about I'll give you $15 billion of gas subsidies if you sign a trade deal with me? And he did not put an exclusive condition on it, but he said, sign it with me, which, you know, in effect was exclusive, but they were the ones, the Europeans were the ones who set the terms on it, of course, at American request. And then, so Yanukovych, the president, said, well, geez, I feel like I just showed up at my wedding to be faced with a prenuptial agreement with all these brand new terms and conditions. And so now I'm walking and turned and left. Very cut and dry, pretty obvious story of what happened there. They gave him a, an offer, you know, on their part, wittingly or not. They gave him an offer he couldn't possibly accept. And so, and especially because he was elected by primarily the people in the East, which is where all the old Soviet era industry is based, and where when they lose their protectionism from the European Union, they have a lot to lose in the short term. Now, we're free market guys, and we like lower prices, but they're looking at losing the few factories they've got left where they work and making that, uh, you know, more nationalist and protectionist, uh, uh, at least have that perspective in the East there. So, um, he, uh, he basically was up against the wall and couldn't sign the deal. So when he didn't sign the deal, then the people in the West who were pro-EU and uh, I guess ultimately NATO uh, and pro-Orange Revolution, and it's oversimplified and broken down as, as you know, kind of Russian nationalists versus uh, Ukrainian nationalists as far as, you know, even ethnicity and that kind of thing. And I think that's probably kind of oversimplified. It's more of an east-west divide, it seems like, and an economic divide. But uh, so they did another Orange Revolution. Basically, it was called the Maiden. And uh, John McCain, Senator McCain, and Victoria Newland, who's the American 
uh, Undersecretary of State for European Affairs, which is basically the ambassador to the EU, uh, and, and Jeffrey Pyatt, the ambassador to Ukraine, they all went and sided with the protesters and fed them cookies and sandwiches and all of this stuff. And McCain got up there on the stage with all the revolutionary forces and all this. And uh, then the phone call was leaked before the coup ever happened. The phone call was leaked of Victoria Newland and Jeffrey, Co and Jeffrey Pyatt plotting the coup. And you can hear the entire thing on YouTube. And they say, you know, we've got a midwife this thing. Yats is the guy. That's her nickname, uh, Newland. Oh, by the way, she's Robert Kagan, the famous neoconservative alter ego of Bill Crystal. She's his wife. And she's on there plotting the coup and saying, uh, you know, uh, we got to hurry up and do it before the Russians shoot it down and all this. And, and naming who should be in charge and who should be uh, happy to get the second and third positions behind him and, and all this kind of thing. And then, lo and behold, uh, I think a week and a half later, um, they, they sign a deal while well, snipers start shooting people in the square. And I don't know if it's a 100% proven fact, but eh, I'm pretty sure it's a pretty solid case that they were provocateur snipers who were shooting both sides, that they were hired mercs shooting both sides. Um, and, the, and in fact, the one guy admitted it. Uh, it was interviewed in the German press who talked about it uh, what, just a couple of months ago, in fact, um, and, and was working under the orders of the right sector. Uh, which I'll get to that uh, in just a second longer here. Um, but then what happened was they, the protesters have been very violent. They included a bunch of Nazis. These right sector guys are a bunch of neo-fascists, openly proclaimed, uh, you know, SS lightning bolts and, and Hitler uh, slogans and Confederate flags and the rest of this, which I think is kind of funny in a way. But anyway, uh, the last part, the Confederate flag part. Um, and, and they forced the president to sign a deal that said that he would pull his police back if they would agree to hold elections in December. And this is, again, this is in, uh, or I don't know if I said, I'm sorry, this is in February of 2014. And so the police pulled back and the Nazis did not pull back and live up to, to the protesters end of the deal. They just seized all the government buildings and ran the government out of town. And it was just in the words of the head of Stratfor being interviewed uh, by Komersat, uh, the Russian paper, or I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, uh, he said it was the most blatant coup in history. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger didn't actually use the word coup, but he basically admitted as much in an interview with Der Spiegel. And, and uh, oh, and well, let me just say, of course, the narrative here is, oh, my God, Russian aggression, just like Kennan predicted. Look, they dare to resist. The Russians came and broke off Crimea that had belonged to them since the days of the Articles of Confederation in this country and which has a population that now, according to German pollsters, 93% support what happened, that they have been reintegrated into Russia. And they, the Russians didn't really invade, they just called their troops to leave their naval base. They had Marines and, and uh, whatever special forces there on their naval base at Sevastopol anyway. And you might not ever hear this anywhere. Um, I mean, you may know, but your audience may be completely unaware that when the Russians took Crimea, not a single shot was fired or one was fired up in the air as a warning shot. And that was it. No one was killed. So that's not quite an invasion and the and the, you know, aggression seizing of Crimea the way that they portray it. It had only belonged to Ukraine since 1954 when Khrushchev gave it away when he was drunk in the middle of the night. And, and it didn't matter anyway because everybody answered to the Kremlin. There was no such thing as Ukraine then anyway as a real political entity. I mean, pseudo, but you know what I mean. It made no difference whether it was a Ukrainian, part of Ukraine or not. It was all part of the USSR at the time. Um, but so... Um, they use that and they just pretend like, oh my God, Russian aggression. This is just like that time that Hitler rolled into Czechoslovakia. That's what Hillary Clinton said. And we are all <laughs> supposed to just pretend there's no trade deal. There's no right sector Nazi uh, fascists in the streets. Uh, there are no, uh, there, there's no history, no detail of a coup d'etat that you could possibly know of that just doesn't exist. History begins the day that the little green men left their base and seized the Crimean Peninsula, and then when the people in eastern Ukraine announced that they did the exact same script. They just seized the buildings. They didn't kill anybody. They just seized the buildings and said, well, we're going to do our little Occupy thing too, and we refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the new government, the coup d'etat Nazi-backed government in Kiev, and the new 
the coup junta launched a war against them, called it an anti-terrorism operation and launched a war against them. And John Brennan, uh, the head of the CIA, went over there to help him coordinate the thing. New York Times goes, oh, God, look at the Russians indulging in these conspiracy theories that John Brennan is over there. And they're writing that a day after it was already confirmed that, yes, it's true, he was over there plotting to the launch of this war. And so now where we are, we're a year and a half into this mess since the coup, uh, you know, more than that, I guess, since the, the start of the maiden controversy and all that. Um, and we have a tentative ceasefire with violations going on all the time, but not from the top, apparently. It's more like the guys on the lines are still firing at each other, uh, you know, from time to time. People are being killed, but it's not an official restart of the war yet. And... You know, the Germans and the French went over there and cut this peace deal with Putin, and the Americans have been trying to scotch it. You know, the, the, uh, it's not just the, the, uh, the Congress, the Congressional Hawks, McCain and them. It's Obama is the one who orders soldiers to move, and he sent the U.S. Army over there in the hundreds to train these guys and sent them at least dozens and dozens, scores and scores of Humvees and other heavy trucks and equipment, uh, although supposedly not weapons. But... Uh, you know, they're building up the ability of the Kiev regime to go back to war uh, against the East. And, and all of this, just imagine for a moment, which I always say this about Palestine. I wish people would think about Palestine in these terms. But think about what's going on in Ukraine in the opposite terms. If the Russians had been doing this in Canada, if they'd been gobbling up so, uh, South and Central America or Mexico, they've been gobbling up South and Central America in the expanded Warsaw Pact after Ronald Reagan drove us to bankruptcy back in the Cold War. And now they've overthrown, they used a bunch of Hitler loving, avowed Nazis to overthrow the government of Mexico and in order to, you know, put missiles on the Rio Grande. We would nuke Moscow. We would have nuked Moscow a year and a half ago. The Americans, are you kidding me? If the shoe was on the other foot here, this would have been, look what they did in Cuba in 1962, and, or 60, yeah, two in the, in the missile crisis. Um, they almost went to full-scale thermonuclear war over missiles in Cuba that were no more deadly than the missiles in Russia that could have wiped America off the face of the planet anyway. And they were willing to, to kill us all in, a, in the ultimate ultimatum, the, sorry, in the ultimatum to the, the Soviets that we will go to war over this. You're getting your missiles out of Cuba right freaking now. And they back down over it. But, you know, you, you switch the position for a minute. What America's doing, we're trying to steal away Russia's Canada and put our country, our, our, uh, not, and not just a loyal government, a friendly government, an EU trade relationship government, but as as has been avowed and declared, to integrate them into NATO, our military alliance. So it's just, and then, but oh, Putin, dictator, Putin, Hitler, Putin, Stalin, Putin, Tsar, uh, rise, uh, it's the Russian Empire, it's the new Soviet Union, he's just like Hitler. And all these slogans and all this just bombast fills in for the way too much detail I just gave you there, but it fills in for any kind of real narrative about what's happening here, any story about, you know, what preceded what, why anything, you know, uh, is happening at all. It all just is, and you know, I, it may have even been Henry Kissinger who said, you know, for a, a global conquering dictator, Vladimir Putin sure is taking his time, dude. He's been in power for 15 years. Now he's going to conquer, <laughs> you know, all of Eastern Europe, like to the Elbe River, like in the battle days of the USSR. Come on, man. If Henry Kissinger can admit that the U.S. started this and the whole thing is unnecessary, then I guess that's all the confirmation bias I need. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, pe people say us anarchists are dangerous. And everything we've just been talking about is all statist. It's all uh, statist uh, governments, uh, mostly the U.S. government, uh, the mo uh, clearly the most evil government on, on the planet today. Uh, they're just all over the place, bombing people, screwing things up. Risking um, nuclear war. <laughs> oh, Risking, yeah, they're doing that, too. You know, yeah. The, the Russians could kill us all. How about that for the bottom line of that story? comes down to it, there are limits to how far you can push the Kremlin. Sorry that anybody had to hear that from me, but apparently this is brand new and not conventional wisdom in the corridors of power between New York and D.C. Huh? Oh, they can fight back? You don't say. 
Yeah, it's weird as an anarchist that I actually kind of like Vladimir Putin. <laughs> um, of course, I don't like any politician. I don't like any government. It goes against everything I believe in. But uh, if I had to pick Barack Obama or Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin, I'd, I'd totally take Putin. He's been like very calm through all this stuff. Uh, whenever they're attacking him or doing things all around his country, uh, he's very calm. He doesn't really do too much. Uh, he just sort of sits there and smiles and, and waits. Uh, he's, you know, this is the exact opposite of what they're trying to paint a picture of him as. Right. Yeah. And of course, he's just smart. You know, they keep, they've said probably 10 or 15 times that Russia in the last year that Russia has invaded Ukraine. Thousands of troops are pouring across the border. Three to five to 10 or 15,000 soldiers. Here they come. But nobody ever has any pictures of them because they're all imaginary. And then you're right, Putin plays it just deadpan. And he just goes, you know what? I thought long and hard about how much fun it might be to go down to Sevastopol and visit our NATO friends at their new naval base. And, you know, I thought about it, and I thought, that'd be really nice, guys, but I think we'll go ahead and keep it for now. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's aggression? It's, it ought to, I mean, and I'm sorry, because it's, it's um, you know, it's unfortunate that you have to even make the point about what is even the truth of the situation at all, never mind opinions about, you know, what caused it, uh, what, what benefits or risks or anything else. I mean, we can't even, it takes, I'm sorry, it takes me anyway, 25 minutes to even just lay out a basic sketch of the truth before we can even get to an argument about, well, you know, I don't know, he seems like a pretty conservative Republican to me. I don't like him at all, but he sure as hell is not guilty of any of the things that the Americans have accused him of being guilty of this entire time, so... That's yeah, I don't know something. if you've heard this. I've got this from fairly high-level sources, uh, big sources, uh, and they've told me that they are aware that Russia at this moment in time has some sort of advanced technology that's bigger than the U.S. military. And uh, did you hear about uh, something about Russia shutting down a U.S. warship last year? Did you hear about this story? No. So I, I don't know how much of this is true. I'm, I'm speculating a little bit here, but uh, there's some uh, people saying that a Russian uh, sh uh, jet uh, strafed a U.S. warship uh, last year somewhere in the Mediterranean or somewhere around there and turned everything off on it. Like they have this uh, electromagnetic pulse uh, technology or something. And uh, if the story is true, uh, it scared the crap out of the Americans uh, because they realized that uh, the Russians have something they don't. And uh, so there's this, all these sort of things sort of happen it's it's uh, it's really sad and it's crazy that we have to go through all this because your average person in Russia does not want to attack the United States. Your average person in the U.S. does not want to attack Russia, and it's just people like John McCain and all these people just trying to create these problems to try to get enough people to uh, uh, consent to them taking all their money and going over and just blowing things up for no reason. Yeah. Well, as you said, it's the Wolfowitz doctrine, and uh, you know it's Andrew Coburn. Uh, one of the three Coburn brothers, uh, the author of the book Rumsfeld, he says the neoconservative movement is where the military industrial complex meets the Israel lobby. That basically, you know, the bankers and the oil men already had the Council on Foreign Relations and Brookings and this and that. But, you know, Lockheed and General Dynamics and Raytheon, they needed some think tanks of their own. And so they teamed up with the Israelis, basically. And they said, and this is kind of depicted in Jacob Helbron's book, they knew they were right, that well, we'll just create 15 of our own little Council on Foreign Relations. They'll mostly be pieces of paper in Bill, in Bill Crystal's desk drawer, uh, you know, polite legal fictions. That, and it's basically just, you know, Richard Pearl and, and his people writing uh, policy papers and, and, you know, guaranteeing that they always <laughs> know what to do in any given crisis. And, uh, uh, but, you know, what they said from 1991 on was now that the Soviet Union is gone, that we, or 1992 in the defense plan and guidance, uh, we will never allow another near-peer competitor to us. We will maintain permanently from now on for the rest of human history a military advantage so great that no power or even combination of powers will even try to match us because they know that we'll hit them before they got anywhere near strong enough to resist us. And so, uh, you know, that's the same policy that continues to this day. And, you know, as Phil Weiss has done a great job of digging up all these great quotes of Erin Crystal and, um, and uh, 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 Norman Podhoritz and all these guys talking about their primary interest 
in American imperialism is just making sure that the American people never get Vietnam syndrome too bad, never insist on an end to the empire, um, and so that America can stay engaged enough to always guarantee the security of Israel. And that's their, you know, primary motive. But in so doing, and they've sold the American, in the entire American establishment, the military, on this theory of, of permanent dominance of the planet. And, you know, of course, if you just look at a map, it shows you how silly this is. That the middle part of North America is supposed to rule all of the old world forever somehow, from the sea lanes or whatever. Uh, it makes no sense at all. And it's obviously, you know, breaking our bank and attempting to do it. It's not making us more powerful. It's making us less powerful. But you know what? Wolfowitz is rich. He's cashed his Lockheed dividend checks, and you know him and his buddies are doing fine. There's a great article called Lockheed Stock and Two Smoking Barrels by Richard Cummings. And in there, he, he traces the, the real employment history where virtually every single one of the neocons in the Bush Jr. administration, not necessarily like all of Krauthammer and every opinion writer, but of the neocons actually in the Bush Jr. administration, they all were tied to Lockheed, every single one of them, basically. You know, Pearl and Fife and Shulsky and Wormser and Libby and John Hanna and Harold Road and, 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 and did I say Stephen Hadley on the National Security Council, Rice's deputy. And, I mean, these were all Lockheed guys as much as they were Israeli guys. And, and you know, it's, and, you know, y you wave a little bit of American flag and you wave a little bit of, hey, who was nicer to their enemies than us after World War II, the way we treated Germany and Japan. We just love them so much. And, yeah, we rule the world, but only to guarantee the peace and stability that creates freedom and prosperity for everyone. Free markets and democracy, as uh, Bill Clinton used to sell it all the time. And, you know, that story, as bogus as it is, um, you know, is a really hard one uh, for American you know, individuals to get over. I mean, they might even incorporate a little bit of truth about the military industrial complex and Lockheed and maybe even a little bit about the Israel lobby or something. But whether the American military ultimately is a force for good on the planet Earth, like they say in the Navy commercials, most of that kind of goes without saying. And yet, you know, as you were saying there, this is, you know, here we are in a, in a very uh, confrontation with the Russians. Uh, when each government on each side could kill all of us, certainly in each country, and, and set back human civilization uh, a few thousand years, uh, if not eradicate it entirely, while no American, regular American people or Russian people have beef whatsoever. It's only these politicians who guarantee their own narrow interests at the expense of the rest of us who can get us into this mess, which is back where we started again, about the myth of national defense, that actually this isn't for us. And, and in fact, we'd be a lot better at defending ourselves if we had no standing army whatsoever than uh, you know, having this Congress and this presidency and this group of DC goons uh, ruling the world in the name and putting us all in danger in the name of keeping us safe. Yeah, there's uh, so many people with guns in the U.S. that it, there's no need at all for any sort of military. Uh, no one could ever take over that country. Uh, no one really wants to. It's mostly the Americans who are this, uh, the American government the, uh, that really want to take over places now. It, most, pe most places have sort of moved on. They're like, yeah, we just want to you know, uh, have voluntary trade and, and you know, live our own lives and things like that. It's, it's just like the U.S. that's still on this like, mission to go into every place and screw it up. And uh, yep. it's crazy. Uh, do you have any sort of predictions about the next few months or the next year or so? Anything? Because uh, to me, it seems like things are heating up. There's even a, they've been doing something in Macedonia recently. Uh, looks like another sort of Ukraine style thing to me. Uh, do you see, um, and you keep hearing a lot of uh, talk about uh, people saying this. Could, uh, there was one U.S. guy who recently said this could go nuclear very fast. Now, I don't know if he's just trying to scare people into going to more wars or whatever, but uh, I, I wonder if you have any sort of predictions about what might be coming. Well, as far as the Macedonia thing, uh, yeah, I did one interview on that with Nabot Samalic uh, from RT, formerly from Antiwar.com, and it's all about the pipelines. It's all about the Russians are trying to build a pipeline to Europe through Macedonia, and the Macedonians are going along with it, and so the Americans are backing the coup forces against the current government there. And uh, that's the bottom line of that. Uh, Justin Romando wrote one good one about it at Antiwar.com, and then... Um, Man, I'm not sure if I can recommend another place that has real good stuff about that. I, I really kind of let it fall off my own radar, but you're right that that's an ongoing uh, problem. 
So we'll see if I can find out more about that in the next few days, in fact, and get somebody else back on the show about it. Um, yeah, well, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm actually really happy to say that lately my predictions have sucked really bad. Uh, <laughs> I thought that we would have a full-scale occupation in Libya and uh, within a year, because uh, it was so obvious that with Gaddafi going, the entire government is going to fall, and there's going to be a massive power vacuum and a massive war. And as we talked about, these are the Bin Ladenites that we're fighting for. So how long till the suicide truck bombs start going off? And then next thing you know, we got to build them up so we can stand down and give them a democracy and a purple finger election and all this kind of thing. And I also thought that, um, you know, I mean, it's been unbelievable as I've even covered it on a daily basis for four years straight, the rise of the Islamic State. I thought once they declared the caliphate in Mosul a year ago that, Maybe it'll take a while to reorient our policy from an Israel first to an America first foreign policy, and or not really an America first, an empire first foreign policy, but ours, not theirs. Um, and yet, no, here it's still been an entire year, and our policy is so muddled between fighting for Iran and backing uh, the Shiite militias ag against the Islamic State in Eastern Islamic State, the land formerly known as Iraq, while at the same time, we're still backing the Mujahideen in Syria this whole time because that's what Israel wants and that's what Saudi want, uh, you know, more than anything. Um, and so that policy is still so confused and muddled, I think, that the irony is that thankfully, because of all the trees that in Washington, D.C., thankfully, we haven't had a full-scale invasion of Iraq. And I was just wrong about it. And I almost to this day, I can't believe it, that they've got a guy who basically is, is Osama himself. There's no difference between this guy Baghdadi and Osama up there you know beating his chest and saying what are you gonna do about it and they haven't done a damn thing about it and you know thank God um, because again anything that they do try to do about it would be horrible but I just I almost can't believe it that we don't have 50,000 guys uh, you know uh, paratroopers bailing out and invading Mosul, Fallujah, Ramadi right now Marines rolling in there uh, you know, from bases in Turkey or wherever. I just, I'm, I'm beside myself with, uh, with uh, happiness about it because uh, it could be, I mean, it already is bad. They are bombing it. But, but I was just wrong at how bad it could be. And I wasn't trying to really be alarmist about it. I really don't like alarmist stuff because usually when I'm alarmist, it's just I'm wrong and then that's embarrassing. So, but in this, I just thought it's, you know, unavoidable that, I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to let Bin Laden incarnate, you know, basically stand up there and declare himself the dictator of all Sunnis on the planet? And they're going to let him get away with that? And yeah. So, um, you know, hopefully more like that. Hopefully we will see, you know, just a fear on the part of the Pentagon and on the part of lame duck Obama to do much worse at any of this stuff right now. They're just, they seem to be basically paralyzed. And, you know, this is the, the status quo in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, Libya, Syria, Iraq, absolutely horrible. Ukraine, absolutely horrible. But you think about how much worse it could all be. And I almost support an Obama third term compared to what Hillary and Jeb Bush are going to bring to us. Think about what the Jeb Bush administration is going to be with Richard Pearl for vice president or, oh, or God. you know, Secretary, Paul Wolfowitz for deputy secretary of defense again or this kind of thing. I mean, it's going to be so bad. He was an original signer of those PNAC statements, you know. Um, so uh, and I don't think Hillary stands a chance against him, honestly. I think it's going to be Jeb and I think he's going to bring all of the worst neoconservatives who have ever been invented with him back into power, just like in the Bush Jr. Uh, Cheney years. And uh, and who knows how bad it's going to get then. I mean, uh, short on anybody who benefits from peace and prosperity, I guess, is my investment advice. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think part of the reason that it hasn't gotten too out of control is because people are, to a small extent, waking up. Like when they tried to attack Syria a couple of years ago and they did that false flag uh, gas attack, which was NATO as far as I can tell, uh, to try to get the Americans to go, look, he's, he's gassing his own people. Um, most people still didn't want to do it. And even recently, I've seen they've been hyping up this ISIS stuff. They keep putting out these fake videos. I don't know if you've seen these videos. I don't know what you think of them. So many of them look totally fake to me. Uh, just like super Hollywood production. Well, there's uh, one like, where they're on the coast in Libya, and the, the ISIS guys are about 13 and a half, 14 feet tall, and all their prisoners <laughs> are like six feet. I don't know. 
Yeah, and the, the, I just watched one where they apparently drowned these guys in a cage, uh, and they had all these camera angles, and they're all like, it was like, look, look like a Hollywood movie, and at the end, uh, the, all these guys were dead, apparently, and the, all their faces were all foamy, apparently, from foam coming out of their lungs, and one of the guys coughs, <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, uh, but people, the, a lot of people just go, so they're trying to uh, whip up some sort of a, a reason to go in there, but people, I think most people in the U.S. are, are just trying to survive right now, thanks to the economy. And it's going to get much, much worse. Um, <clears throat> I think they're losing their ability. Uh, I, sadly, I think it, uh, these people are so sick, people like Cheney and Wolfowitz and all those guys, that they will do another, another 9-11 uh, to get the U.S. into major war. And I think if they're going to do another 9-11, it's going to have to be way bigger uh, because, uh, you know, to get the, the amount of uh, people just saying, yes, let's go and kill everybody. Um, so that's my prediction. Unfortunately, I hope it doesn't come true as well. Obviously, uh, um, that's why we just need to wake people up to to stop listening to their government, to get rid of their governments, to uh, at least to w uh, bring the government down to the smallest uh, amount possible, at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think it's you know who knows what's going to happen. It's going to be a very interesting year, and you're going to be very busy. You've been busy, unfortunately, yeah. at antiwar.com for uh, more than a decade now. Uh, I know you guys at antiwar.com went through a lot of problems over the years. I know there was something to do with the FBI, and then Google Ads shut off your ads. So you guys have been under real attack. And this is like one of the only, uh, just so people know, this is like a real true source for getting excellent information on what's going on militarily around the world. And it's totally free. Uh, and they've been under attack so much. And I know you guys have been under so much pressure. Um, and it's so sad because you're one of the only sites who's saying, hey, anti-war, not pro-war. I can't believe anyone's pro-war. I don't know where that mindset comes from. Uh, but so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the struggles at antiwar.com and, and also what you're, what you're doing now. I know you're doing something to raise some money for uh, both antiwar.com and for the Scott Horton Show. And why don't you tell us a little bit about, about your troubles and a little bit about how people can help? Sure. Well, yeah, you know, uh, the FBI, uh, and this goes back to September 11th, Justin Raimondo wrote an article um, about an FBI list of original suspects, I guess, in the September 11th attack that they had sent out to some financial institutions and that an Italian financial institution had posted this PDF file online. So at antiwar.com, they reposted it because one of the names on the list was the guy that owned Urban Moving Systems in New Jersey, which owned the van with the high fivers and the, the so-called dancing Israelis uh, celebrating the 9-11 attack who told the cops, your problem is our problem, see these damn terrorists, that kind of thing. And um, so uh, if I have the story right, it was because his name was on the, the file was why antiwar.com was, was running it and talking about it. And then they used that as the basis to open an illegal investigation of antiwar.com under the completely bogus theory that they had reason to believe, reasonable suspicion or whatever cause uh, to believe that antiwar.com was an agent of a foreign power and that it was, uh, you know, not backed by Americans, but that it was backed by, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrorist enemies of the United States. And so they used the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance pa Act and their surveillance powers that they have over suspected uh, agents of foreign governments or foreign terrorist groups in order to uh, investigate antiwar.com on a much lower threshold of evidence than they would ever need for an actual criminal case. And it was totally illegal. And when the documents were released, uh, the ACLU said this is the first time they'd known that this had happened, but it was the first time that they could prove that the uh, FBI had used their Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act powers against an American journalist establishment. And so ACLU picked up the cause and is suing the federal government on behalf of antiwar.com right now. And um, so the problem, the big problem with that for antiwar.com is that it scared away a lot of antiwar.com's donors because, of course, it says right there in the PDF, the, the documents there, Oh, we better investigate who all is giving them money and make sure nobody's friends with Saddam Hussein or whatever kind of crap in there. So everybody is saying, hey, man, I got a wife and a kid and a mortgage, and so I got to get out of here. I'm, you know, good luck, you guys, but no more donations from me. And so that has really hurt antiwar.com. And, and that was uh, pre-Bitcoin, of course. Know, Otherwise, five of uh, us have been laid off from there you know, since yeah. that happened, since that story broke out. So it has definitely hurt. 
Yeah, and that was pre-Bitcoin, so uh, mm. unfortunately you didn't have that option at that time where you could have a fairly anonymous way for people to donate, uh, but uh, luckily we have that now. Yeah, that's true. I uh, definitely do take Bitcoins. And then, uh, yeah, so I actually still work there. As you said at the beginning, I'm the opinion editor there, although I'm laid off. I don't actually work there anymore. I, I, I work a great many hours, but, uh, you know, I... I uh, and I never did make much of a salary in the first place anyway, of course, as a small little nonprofit organization. People think Randolph Bourne must have been some rich old billionaire who left us a bunch of money. You know, that they hear the Randolph Bourne Institute, which is just a piece of paper, right? It's just the legal shell of antiwar.com. But people think, oh, it must be like some rich foundation or the, you know, like the Olin Foundation. Or, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it's just a small little thing, but... Um, so I'm earning most of my money now off commercials on my own radio show. And then right now it's my summer fun drive and I'm raffling off tickets to Costa Rica. No, not tickets. I shouldn't say it like that. You got to pay your own airfare. But uh, the winner of the raffle uh, gets to stay there for a week in their own private house, three meals a day. And it's by the river on this great permaculture farm in the jungle in Costa Rica. And um, the guy who uh, runs it is a libertarian, I believe. Seems like an individualist anyway, uh, who, you know, got so sick of the empire, he just up and left, went down there, bought this property, and uh, he's turned it into this great permaculture farm. And uh, it seems really cool. I wish I could go, but I got a conflict of interest on the raffle. You see, I can't draw my own card. But uh, <laughs> looks like it's going to be a real cool thing. And, and he offered it up uh, a week stay down there. Um, for people who are interested, it's just scotthorton.org slash raffle. That's my website, scotthorton.org slash raffle, uh, to find out all the details of it. It's 50 bucks. Uh, if people are interested in that, sure seems like a good week, uh, down there in the jungles of Costa Rica for anybody can do it. The drawing is on July 15th and you can go whenever you want. So if you want to wait till Christmas time and go to Costa Rica for Christmas, do whatever you want to do, then that's what you do if you're the winner there. So, uh, thanks for letting me mention that. I appreciate it. I want to try to uh you know it's a lot more fun if there's a lot more people involved never mind the money but it's just no fun if there's so few entries right we need more and more entries to make it so much fun yeah it's just one way you can help and i know a lot of our viewers are really into things like permaculture and they're also interested in getting outside of the u.s so this might be a good opportunity for somebody to both help you and uh, um possibly win a chance to uh, stay on the permaculture farm for a week and learn about permaculture and learn about life in Costa Rica. So yeah. uh, if you feel like supporting antiwar.com or Scott Horton and everything they're doing, uh, go check out that uh, raffle if you're interested and uh, be uh, very well uh, uh, received uh, because uh, they need all the help they can get, especially after that. Did uh, Antiwar get their Google ads back up? No, they've had to. Yeah, <laughs> we had a whole controversy. I'm sorry you asked me about that. I forgot. Uh, if people want to read about that, uh, Dan Sanchez has written the best piece about what happened there with Google taking down their ads from antiwar.com, which of course were a significant uh, portion of the revenue, a fifth of it or something like that. And they took them down under the excuse of the Abu Ghraib pictures that have been up there since 2004. And, uh, uh, you know, and they've been doing that to a lot of people lately as well. And uh, so uh, Dan Sanchez has a great write-up. If people just look up antiwar.com, Dan Sanchez, and Google, uh, you'll find he's, he's a really talented writer and uh, has, a, has a great write-up about that entire catastrophe. And it's, yeah, it's really something else, man. Uh, I was actually a bit surprised by it. But, oh, and one more thing about the raffle. It's uh, Verde, or it's, well, it's the URL is like Verde Energia, but they share an E there. So it's Verde Energia, kind of. Uh, but if you go to scotthorton.org slash raffle, you can click the link through and look at the website of the Permaculture Farm. And they have a, a whole set of pictures that people can look at of the beautiful jungle there and all that kind of thing. So you really get a good idea of, of, of what you're getting into there because they've got a great website there. That's great. Yeah, talking about Google uh, with their uh, tagline, don't be evil. Yeah. I was just at Bilderberg in Austria where Eric Schmidt was. And yeah. uh, to me, their tagline should be don't expose evil because that's basically what they're doing by yeah. trying to turn off sites like yours. They're, they're really attacking a lot of the, the liberty and truth sites out there, uh, which uh, should be a, a hint to people about uh, which side Google's on. And Eric Schmidt, I believe, is in the White House two or three times a week. That should be another big indication. Uh, so we've got a huge amount of competitors out there. He, 
huge amount of people who want to stop this information. So uh, please support in any way you can. Antiwar.com and, and the Scott Horton Show. If you don't know it, check it out. He already gave the URL. And uh, great stuff. And they've been covering this and uh, for years. And uh, probably one of the best sources of information about what's going on militarily around the world and exposing it. So it's great stuff. Uh, so that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. When you consider that you have to spend all your time basically unteaching what your kids just learned. So not only must the government recognize natural rights, but the government can't disparage them. Unfortunately, the people in the government have a hole in their copy uh, where the Second Amendment is, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. So, you know, this is not so saintly. I mean, you know, because he's got the reputation of favoring, uh, you know, ending slavery. But he wasn't an opponent of slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were opponent of slavery, but not Abe Lincoln. I mean, the actual argument and the explanation is pretty darn simple. I mean, it's, it's so simple as to almost be self-evident. I mean, things like self-ownership and the non-aggression principle, it's, it takes about three seconds to demonstrate that government can't be legitimate. Well, I, th I think uh, human beings have the right to shape their own reality. And that's what's been taken away from us. We are participating involuntarily in a system that shapes our reality for us. And the first step is to not allow that. You're paying off your debt, you have to pay off your car loans, your mortgage, you have to maybe even live with your parents, and then you look back at your life and you did nothing. You never challenged yourself, you never experienced anything, you never lived your life because you kept doing what the machine told you to do. From Acapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.